So the question is, was it worth it? Three years ago, the world was captivated by a series of uprisings. Awakening, they called it, an Arab Spring. Everywhere from um, Tunisia, to Egypt, to Libya, to Syria, to Yemen, to Bahrain, everyone was very hopeful, very optimistic. But looking at the scorecard three years later, it's rather dismal. In the case of Syria, we have a series of peaceful protests that turned into a civil war, then a proxy international war, and then some, some would like to see it as a burial ground for today's terrorists. Others are afraid it might be a breeding ground for tomorrow's terrorists. In the case of uh, Libya, well, Libya was able to get rid of its despot, but not the despot's weapons. They are there, poisoning not just the swords of Libya, but uh, points beyond. In the case of Egypt, the Democrats fought the autocrats and caused a regime change. Then it seems the theocrats stole the thunder of the Democrats, so the Democrats called on the autocrats to get rid of the theocrats. Well, will the, theocrat, will, will the autocrats give back to the Democrats what they are owed? Still to be seen. In the case of Yemen, well, we're heading towards what seems to be a federal system that recognizes the fact that Yemen is severely fragmented. It's not really a question of uh, federalism for, le for local rule as much of federalism that recognizes a segmentation that is incurable. In the case of Bahrain, it seems to be business as usual for the Fifth Fleet, except what are those protests that seem to be uh, uh, continuing about rule of law and uh, other themes? Well, uh, so was it worth it? Only in Tunisia, it seems that there's a glimmer of hope about something positive, maybe through a national dialogue of some sort. So, the question may be, was it avoidable? What is shared by all these countries is, in fact, an unstated, what was shared, an unstated social contract through which the political class demanded and received acquiescence from its public in exchange for a promise a promise for services such as education, health, employment, retirement, false promises because they were not tenable. Maybe tenable for some time in some places, but positively not tenable for everyone. So was it avoidable? It seems that because of the false promise, because it was not tenable, sooner or later this was bound to happen. No one could tell when it would happen. No one could tell that uh, a lonely street vendor in provincial Tunisia will ignite what he has ignited. Well, uh, when we add to the region the fact that we have the perennial Israeli-Palestinian question, we have an Iran that would like to be a regional hegemon, and we have Al-Qaeda springing from the region, we realize that it's a very difficult region. However, the community of values, that is the Transatlantic Alliance, could not ignore it. Not because of values, but also not because of interests. It cannot be ignored. Accordingly, what the German Marshall Fund has been doing for quite a while, through our Mediterranean strategy meetings, we have, had, uh, we have always invited uh, public intellectuals and officials from the region to uh, discuss with their counterparts from Europe and uh, the United States and beyond on the best ways to deal with the issues of the region. In uh, our uh, Ankara office, we have always focused on the important role of Turkey, not as a possible model, but really as a major actor and a major influence on a region that proves to be of crucial importance to us all. In our recently opened Tunis office, we really have an innovative program to support civil society in a region in which maybe the, the counterbalance to the state will be a citizen empowered through civil society. We have partnerships from Morocco to Lebanon. And through all of it all, I would say we have an ambitious program, an ambitious program that uh, is worth it, even if it is ultimately a modest step forward. Probably in all of these regions, all of these countries with all the problems that we face in all of them, probably the most acute and the most tragic is Syria. And this is indeed the subject of the next panel. Thank you very much.
Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming out on a Saturday morning. We have a great session in front of us with a great panel. But let me start by perhaps just giving a little bit of facts on the grounds so that we're all on the same page. On security terms, Assad's forces are on the rise. And there is internal fighting amongst the opposition. Politically, the second round of the Geneva talks that took place in February did not appear to go anywhere. There is apparently going to be a third round, but we do not have a date. And the two sides can't even dis agree upon what should be the topic for discussion. The civilian opposition is also fractured, and we'll hear a little bit about, of the, about that. And of course, the Assad regime called for an election in April of this year. On the humanitarian side, according to the UN, an estimated 9.3 million people inside the country require assistance. Of those, approximately 3 million remain trapped in areas which are hard to access due to the fighting. There are 6.5 million internally displaced, another 2.3 million fled to neighboring countries, and we will also talk a little bit about that. And then finally, the international. Russia, Iran, and Hezbollah continue to support the government. The West and the, the Saudis principally continue to support the opposition, different opposition groups. There's a Saudi-Iranian proxy war playing out. And just so that we can have at least one piece of good news, uh, it was announced this past week that 45% of the Syrian uh, chemical weapons have actually now left the country. They're a little bit behind in the, in the uh, shipments, but nevertheless. With that intro, I want to first of all go to a quick poll to see whether it really is as black in everybody else's mind as the facts would suggest. Can we put the poll up on the... Everybody get out your electronic gadgets, your pads, your, your phones. Can we get a, uh, the poll on the uh, screen? Possibly? You can get me on the screen. The poll would be far more interesting. Thank you very much. What is the most likely scenario for Syria in the next two to three years? You have six options. You're going to have 15 seconds to decide. The first one, opposition wins, regime falls, and the country goes into transition. Option two, Geneva II creates a transitional government. Three is stalemate. Four is that the regime prevails. Five is that Syria is divided into a stable south and volatile north. And six, contagious instability in the region. So please, will you press the button now? You have 15 seconds. I feel like I should be on a talk show with the ticker timing down. That's a little scary. If I need another occupation, I know where to go. Vanna White or something. It's, uh, <laughs> and... Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, everybody else is as... Uh, pessimistic as I am. That's rather sad to see. Um, as I said, we have an absolutely fantastic um, panel in front of us. Let me briefly introduce them, because you do actually have them in your books. On the far right, as, as well, the far left as you look at it, um, we have Kristalina Georgieva, the Commissioner for International Cooperation, Humanitarian Aid and Crisis Response at the European Commission. Next to her, Alia Mansour, member of the Syrian National Coalition. Next to Alia, we have Soli Ozel from Kadir Haas University. And of course, on the, on the far right, at Dr. Anne-Marie Slaughter, who is the president and CEO of New America Foundation. Let me, if I may, start with you, Alia. Um, <coughs> the opposition is fractured. You represent the Syrian National Coalition. What actions are you doing to bring together the, the civilians, the Syrian civilians, to really represent all Syrians. What are you doing and what are the obstacles you're facing at the moment? Actually, the opposition is united. We have the same goal. We have different point of views, which is normal, but we have the same goal to build a democratic, free Syria. Our, we have the same, one enemy, which is Bashar al-Assad and his regime. But the international community is looking for a reason not to support us, which uh, he did not... Uh, find it as a, a reason not to support uh, our colleagues, our uh, fellow in uh, uh, Yemen or in uh, Libya or in Egypt. No, we are uh, united. We have the same goal. As I said, we need to get rid of Assad. 
And we have to keep in mind that after 40 years of dictatorship, we lack the political experience. I know that there was, a, it was enormously controversial uh, when you decided to start negotiations in Geneva too with the uh, Assad regime. How are you dealing with the fact that many people thought that was a wrong decision? Even people who thought it was a wrong decision supported the delegation group in Geneva. Only, only the regime was not believing in a political solution. All the groups of the opposition, whether we, they went to Geneva or not, they were supporting the delegation in Geneva. Well, that's, that's good to hear, rather more positive than we, than we hear in our papers, and we'll come back to that idea, I'm sure. Uh, Kristalina Georgieva, there is huge problems with getting humanitarian aid to the region. As we know, there was a UN Security Council resolution that said both sides need to provide access, and yet it isn't happening. How are you dealing with that? How are you actually putting more pressure, if that's what's needed, to actually get that kind of access? Uh, today is exactly one month since the adoption of this resolution, and uh, it requires reporting of what has been achieved. Uh, and there will be a report, and it would be long, but it would say in one sentence, we are bailing the ocean with a slightly bigger spoon. What is happening is uh, the needs are so great, the fighting still so intense, and the economy is so destroyed, that even the progress that we are now seeing is not enough to change course in humanitarian terms. Uh, let me just make three points. First, why access is so critical. It is absolutely paramount, because unless we succeed to do more in Syria, the suffering there would be enormous, but also the flow of refugees to neighboring countries will continue and may even intensify. And that means destabilizing the region even further with unpredictable, horrible consequences. Secondly, if we don't get access inside Syria, the, with the prediction that, that there is no yet anything like peace in sight, I just don't know how these people that are, that are there are going to cope and how the country would then rebuild when this madness is finally over. So what we do and what we can do more of. What we do is we have been relentless to get more humanitarian organizations capable to operate inside Syria, both in government-controlled and opposition-controlled areas. Today, the whole of the UN can do it, and we have 16 international organization, uh, organizations operating inside Syria. We are relentless on making sure that convoys go into government-controlled areas and opposition-controlled areas. We from the EU have put 2.6 billion euros, by far the largest donor in humanitarian aid, and we defend a big chunk of that, actually 50% for my budget, to go inside Syria, despite all of the uh, difficulties. Uh, what we now have as a result of the uh, resolution, this is our biggest spoon, we finally do cross-border operations, finally. And two days ago, 79 trucks crossed from Turkey into, into Syria. What we can do more of? I think this is the most important question. First, I'm turning to everybody in this room. We have to keep our eyes on Syria. As international community, we are pathetic in our ability to deal with more than one crisis at one time. We are like eight-year-olds playing soccer. <laughs> we go with the ball, we don't cover the whole, the whole terrain. We have to, we have to stay focused on, on Syria. This is the worst humanitarian catastrophe of our times. This is, this is guilt on each of every one of us on our consciousness. We have to be focused on Syria. Secondly, we have to be creative in what more we can do. For example, uh, I look here at Cathy Ashton. In Europe, we have done something quite remarkable. We have 
taken seriously humanitarian exceptions from our sanctions so we can get more help inside Syria. But we have to work on making these exceptions, deliver agricultural inputs so, so people can farm, uh, medicines, more food. And third, and this third is actually the most critical, we have to pursue peace in Syria. This is the only way to put an end to this madness. And we in the humanitarian community believe there is no military solution. We believe in it. But we are the people without guns. The people with guns don't yet believe it. So we have to make them believe there is no other way but through a peace negotiations. And you know, push for that. I am so tempted right now to go to you, Anne Marie, uh, on on the guns. But I want to <laughs> I, I want to just squeeze in a quick question there to Sally Azal. Uh, we talked. I mean, you saw the numbers up there that this is going to spread. Um, we heard it. The, the the numbers of refugees crossing the border is getting is is getting higher. They're climbing higher and higher and higher. What does this mean to the region? I mean, wh what should the countries around the region, what can they do, what are they doing, what are the challenges that they're facing? Well, just two days ago, we've heard that a car that was coming from the province of Hatay on the border with Syria, uh, crossing the province of Nide, was stopped by the police and the gendarme. And when the guys were asked for their identifications, they started shooting with Kalashnikovs and threw a couple of grenades. Then they were finally captured, one dead, one escaped, and I think three of them were apprehended. They seem to be Arabs. They hold uh, Albanian and Kosovar passports. Our transparent government obviously doesn't give us any information about what had gone on. But that is, if you will, the first known sign, of course, of what many of us have feared in terms of contagion. We know from newspaper reports that there are recruitment offices in Turkey for uh, jihadist elements, and that several provinces nearby have been affected by it. Fathers are going to Syria to search their sons. I'm sure similar things are happening in all the surrounding regions. Already, the contamination from Syria to Iraq, which doesn't need much contamination to begin with, uh, has, has, given us, has given us a re-flourishing of the, of the civil war there and, and the imbalance of political forces. So, in all cases, Syria is, po is, is, is poisoning all the surrounding areas and disturbing the demographic, pre uh, putting demographic pressures, resource pressures on everyone. Turkey, which is probably the more comfortable country around, has been, has been able to provide about 220,000 Syrians, Syrian refugees with decent housing and stuff, but of course this is way beyond our means now, and the Turkish government is eating its pride and basically asking for help from hum the humanitarian <coughs> help community. Uh, unfortunately, I wish I could be as sanguine about as, as you that one, uh, arms would, would stop, because these are wars that are not going to stop until we, know, we have a sense of what the political settlement is going to look like. And the thing is, this is not a political settlement that can be imposed, number one. Number two, we don't have an international community. The word international community is just not a, a truth. I mean, it's, it's just not a reality. Russians who are a party to this conflict obviously do not care about the carnage. The others talk a lot about the carnage and how... how how heart bleeding that is, and obviously they don't, or if they, they do care, they really cannot do much. So this is a political and geopolitical uh, struggle, and until and unless we find ways of disentangling certain things and then bringing all the interests together to actually strike a deal, nothing is going to happen. And the way the world looks today to me, nothing is going to happen. And finally, uh, on, on, on the Syrian opposition as well. I mean, I have met many people from the opposition, but I read also uh, the recently resigned uh, American Ambassador Robert Ford's notes on what happened in Geneva, and quite frankly, I don't see a united front. I don't see a regime that feels that it is under any pressure whatsoever to, make, to cut a deal, and everybody is so preoccupied with everything else, domestically and internationally, that unfortunately, and I really mean this because we feel the heat of it, Syria is going to continue to poison the entire region. So we have a, we have a bit of a political uh, 
opposition, we have the humanitarian, we have the local, regional, Anne-Marie Slaughter, let me ask you about the broader uh, perspectives. I mean, America has come under a lot of uh, pressure to do more than it's doing, so has Europe. Why is so little being done? I mean, you've suggested there's a much more active position, a much more military use of military force position by the US. Why is it not being done? Uh, what's the pressure against it? Why are we seeing this essentially kind of status quo, this, this static position? Because the United States is stuck in a um, constant loop of we can't figure out what to do. And then six months later, it looks like we could have done something six months ago, but now it's too hard to do something. Uh, and that's been going on for two full years, e even beyond. From my point of view, Syria is not only the greatest humanitarian crisis of our time, it is the greatest strategic crisis of our time. And I say that fully aware of what else is going on in the world. It is the greatest strategic crisis crisis of our time. And the way to see this is precisely to start with the humanitarian. This is the Rwanda of our time. Rwanda happened 20 years ago. We are still dealing with war in the Great Lakes region of Africa as a result of the moral crisis of the genocide in Rwanda, but that genocide led to huge outflows of refugees and fighters who then have destabilized the region. And that's what we're looking at uh, in Syria. It is, a, it is the moral equivalent when we finally find out how many people have died and a country destroyed, but equally, all those refugees, the number of refugees in Jordan is the equivalent of all of Canada being in the United States. Just think of that. All of Canada being in the United States, that's in Jordan alone, with respect to Turkey, with respect to Iraq, with respect to the fact we are now creating a homeland for uh, violent extremist jihadi terrorists that is not in the caves of Afghanistan. It is very close uh, to Europe and the United States. So from my point of view, this is, Obama is going to leave a legacy where he shut, he ended the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, and he created uh, all the dangers that were once uh, in Afghanistan and originally in Iraq right smack in a completely destabilized Middle East. The reason we're not acting was initially political. He didn't want to act during the election campaign. Uh, since then, you had the people who were pushing for action no longer there, Petraeus and Secretary Clinton. Secretary Kerry is, ha, wants there to be much more action, but the overall view is the United States people don't want to support it, so we're not going to do it. I'm, I'm going to come to the room because I really want to get everybody's involvement. So uh, catch my eye. I will add you to a list. Um, but I want to push you just a little bit before I, while people, if they needed to think of any questions, did. What should, in your view, you've written quite a lot about this, what should America be doing? In my view, the United States uh, should, uh, under our own authorization and in violation of international law, but still, I would, uh, I would bomb Syria's air force on the ground uh, to stop it, at the very least, from using barrel bombs against its people, destroying, and if you look at what they're actually doing with those planes, uh, they are, are killing people in the worst possible way. I would, that would be a start from a humanitarian point of view, but more importantly, strategically, it would signal that we are prepared to use force. The only time we've done anything in Syria was where we threatened chemical, the use of chemical weapons, which actually the Assad regime believed, and suddenly you got a, a willingness to bargain. I, I think the, unless we're prepared to use force, we will not get the political shift that we need, because I agree there's no permanent military solution to change the dynamics, to make the regime actually willing to bargain, to then cobble together something that could actually stick. Thank what do you do with, the, with an opposition that is not under a single command? You under those circumstances. I mean, I, I, would, I would like to see the Assad government go tomorrow, but what do you do with the situation on the ground whereby the, if the good guys uh, are not really militarily potent or powerful and they can be easily overwhelmed by forces that are actually not very nice? Uh, understood. In the first place, there are 
I, I do think there are more forces, more moderate forces that, do a, that, that are being strengthened right now. But what you do is you put together a transitional government that does include, it includes people from everywhere in Syria, including people, members of the current regime, probably not Assad himself, but others. And then you back that up with some transitional forces uh, and with an international agreement. And the international I, I community did not I, really support the, the moderate uh, uh, free uh, Syrian uh, army. I agree. As soon as they will uh, take the decision to support it, it will be the strongest. And we have been fighting the Al-Qaeda for, uh, for a while now. We have been fighting Al-Qaeda and uh, the regime. Well, but also the use of force would also make a difference in terms of Al Qaeda. When, when we they thought we were coming in with the chemi on the chemical weapons, mm -hmm. Al Qaeda headed for the hills. They were convinced that our drones were coming for them. So I actually think that th there are ways you could make a difference on that score as well. Let me go to the audience. I'm gonna um, this gentleman first, and as we bring a mic over, please introduce yourself. Um, to the audience, please make your comments, your questions. Happy to have a comment, but make it short and sweet. And have a question mark at the end if you can. Also, please address to specific members. We're going to try and get as much commentary around the room as possible. I am going to spread, spread it out. If you want to email your questions, I will try and remember to uh, look at this. But, sir. Arvez Hudboy from Pakistan. For your information, I'd like to tell you that the Saudi government announced, gave rather, $1.5 billion to Pakistan. Immediately thereafter, our government switched its policy on Syria and will now be aiding the Syrian fighters militarily, which means helping the Sunni extremists in Pakistan, those who are indebted to Saudi Arabia. As you know, Saudi Arabia funds thousands of madrasas in Pakistan and was the force behind the Taliban there. If you want to ask, what is it that the West should do? What is it that the United States should do? I'd say stop Saudi Arabia from, from spreading extremism throughout the Muslim world and in aiding this Shia genocide, which is now happening not just in Iraq, but ever more in Pakistan as well. So your first duty is to stop Saudi Arabia and break your alliance with it. Thank you. I, I'm not sure that there was a question there, so I'm, I'm actually, in, and, and unless anybody, uh, fascinating, but I'm not sure there was a question there. Can I there. say one sentence this in response? We could, to do that, we'd have to act ourselves. If we're not prepared to act ourselves, we're going to rely on proxies. I'm going to keep going around this lady here. And, and by the way, even if I know you, I am not going to mention your name, so do not think me rude, but go ahead. <laughs> keep going. I think it'll probably come on. media, for the small media to cover the uh, Syria, to cover the humanitarian aspects like the refugees, because uh, the, uh, now it's so, there's so much going on, you know, everybody wants to take Ukraine, but what about Syria? And we keep pushing, now, but don't forget Syria. And uh, I know, for instance, I've got colleagues, uh, uh, that uh, photographers, and they went at their own expense to cover the refugees uh, Syria. They can't sell their story. And uh, so please, uh, uh, Mrs. Georgie, uh, Commissioner Georgieva and uh, other members of this panel, give us some positive uh, stories coming from the refugee camps or coming from the uh, neighboring country, the solidarity in Lebanon, in all the neighboring countries. Uh, give us some positive stories so that we can attract our, uh, you know, our editors to continue okay. publish uh, about about Syria. Great, thank you, thank, thank you very much, uh, I Commissioner. I not agree more with you that we have to all mobilize to make sure that we don't lose sight of Syria. I was in uh, Iraq last week with a group of journalists exactly for this reason to show one positive story, and it is how the Kurdish region of Iraq hosts. 230,000 refugees takes care of them in a way that is heartwarming. Uh, and the stories went, went uh, uh, out. The stories went out. But the question for us is how to keep attention, political attention, focused on multiple crises? How to do that? 
because what, what I worry is that we slip into whatever is the biggest crisis at the moment. Right now, obviously, Ukraine is throwing a very deep shadow over all places that suffer, not only Syria, Central African Republic, South Sudan. How to do that? And I, I would very respectfully disagree that we should, should give up on the international community. You yourself use the uh, phrase, we should untangle. Who is we? Who is we? This is us. Uh, it is a matter of recognizing our responsibilities and having the maturity to act on them. Uh, the uh, politicians, the media, the ordinary citizens. Uh, and that is what this forum, I believe, is doing. Raising our responsibility for us to bear. No, but please. I, didn't, I said the international community, as you put it, currently does not exist. Iran and Russia is not part of your or my international community. Iran and Russia are supporting a regime. They don't mind that it is an extraordinarily bloody regime using every means available to destroy civilian or fighting forces inside Syria. And obviously, we don't speak the same language with them. And the other community, the rest, those who care about the humanitarian debris that is left behind, is, is not acting with full force, perhaps, and leave you and your organization basically alive. I mean, uh, alone. Well, we can, we can take that for a long time. For a, child that, for a child that survives and goes to school, because of people here, through their contributions, making it possible, there is international community. Uh, Shut Ali, up. You had uh, <laughs> yeah. A sad story about the refugees in Lebanon, for example, we have around 90,000 people who are living under Sayyaj of Hezbollah, the Shiite ex extremist group in Arsal. We are not able to, to give them any, any uh, uh, help because of Hezbollah's fighting inside Syria and in Lebanon. He's not allowing us to deliver any, any humanitarian aid to this 90,000 people. Too many sad stories. This lady here, and then I have this gentleman here. Hello, my name is Spencer Scheller. I'm the director of the Middle East Office of the Heinrich Bildt Foundation in Beirut. I have a question basically to Ali and to, to Soli Ozil, because you were mentioning the divisions within the opposition, which from the beginning have been mentioned as one reason not to really fully support the Syrian uh, revolution. I mean, especially when looking at Geneva too, it was so clear that also the international community was maybe more divided than ever. Who inside the opposition to support with what? So if the question of this panel is, what can the international community do to uh, address the crisis, right? My question to you would be, do you see any real efforts of external supporters of the opposition to find a joint strategy? Or is it all di directed towards the opposition itself, always saying, well, they can't unite? I think that there is such a role of international actors and their divisions that I would like to, s to take your opinion on how much is happening on unifying the external actors as such. Great question. Actually, we, we don't have to be uh, unified under one, uh, uh, under one umbrella, under one group of... Uh, we're not the vast party. We don't, want to, uh, we don't need to, be, uh, to have the same point of views on every single uh, matter. We have the same uh, goal. We have uh, the dream of building a new free Syria. Uh, we don't have to be under uh, the name of one party. Uh, I think the international community is more... Uh, uh, Apart from what's going on, they did not really support the, uh, the opposition from the beginning. And we can see what happened in uh, Libya or uh, Tunisia or Egypt. They did not wait for the opposition to be uh, united. It's a reason the international community is using not to support us. Sully, let me put, put you in and then I'm, I'm going to come to Amri also for you if I could. Well, I mean, How do you get the international community yeah, but solidified? The thing is, I, I Honestly, I'm not sure that outside forces can settle this issue, nor do I think that without their cooperation can it be settled by regional powers. But you've got to, I think, see the fact that regional powers are engaged in Syria for their own geopolitical reasons. And there is no force from outside. 
nuclear, the United States, nuclear Russia, whomever, that can actually prevail on them so long as they're not ready to occupy Syria and basically put order there. So, so I, what's I, first? Mm -hmm. what, what's first? I mean, who, what division needs to be addressed first? I mean, some people will say it's the kind of Iranian-Saudi great game playing out. I mean, what, what, where do we start? I guess you will have to start with, first of all, Turkey and the United States will have to agree on a project and then the United States, despite domestic opposition to dealing properly with Iran, will have to actually start making a deal with Iran. And then I heard that on the sides in Geneva, the Americans and the, uh, when, when the security uh, intelligence chiefs met in Washington, uh, Saudi Arabia was represented by uh, someone other than its own chief and that was given as a sign of maybe the United States and Saudi Arabia would be treating uh, Syria a bit differently. Those are the kinds of things you need more of because time is running out. I mean, look, I come from a city where there is probably at least 150 to 200,000 Syrian refugees. Some of them are prosperous. They have opened their shops. They have opened their businesses. Some of them are middle class. They may even be working professionally. But a vast majority of them are, are new beggars. Every street life, every street. In the cold, in, in the heat, they are barefooted. I mean, this is not something that I'm speaking about in the abstract. I see this every day. But Without the geopolitical deal, we're not going to be able to help them. Just very, very quickly, Amory, does he have it right? It's Turkey, US, then it's US, Iran, and then it's Saudi. Into, is, is that the right order of... It's what the US is hoping, and I do understand that if we got a, a nuclear deal with Iran by July, big if, particularly what's happening now, but if we did, then there would be a possibility of then engaging Iran more on Syria, which is the hope that then, then you could start putting pressure on the government, then you could start putting the, together the political deal. Given where we are, that may be, it may make sense to sort of see if that could happen uh, in July, but if it can't, and, and more broadly, my point is there has to be some action, right? I mean, 75% of this room basically said five years from now we're going to be in the same situation but worse. And I'm saying no matter how bad the options are now, that's not... It's going to get worse. It's going to get much worse. And it's gotten much worse. Two years ago I was sitting on this stage talking about this issue. And now look where we are. What a way to start a Saturday. This gentleman here. <laughs> Uh, my name is uh, Keiro Kitagami. I'm a uh, former MP from Japan. Um, I'd like to ask the question, wh what, does, uh, what is the accurate portrayal of what's going on in Syria? I, I think the American view, in the end, which is shared by most Western countries, is that uh, as much as we would like to see, uh, see Assad go, uh, it is a uh, battle between a dictator and, and the people. But is this really an accurate view? Uh, there, there's, some, uh, there's another interpretation where you can say, uh, Assad was propped up as a leader because uh, most of the Shiites, the other uh, ethnic sectarian groups, did not want a Sunni uh, government. And what I'm what I'm saying is that is it is it really a practical view? If you know the, the common view is if you get rid of the Assad, then uh, and you, you have the opposition come in, then everything will be all right. But the other view is. If you have the opposition coming, uh, coming into power, you will have another bloody massacre because it, it is not a battle between a dictator and the people. It's, it's more of an ethnic, sectarian uh, battle within, within Syria. Ali Mansour, why didn't you? No, I totally disagree with you. Uh, uh, we started our revolution three years ago. It was uh, people and still people from all of Syria uh, asking for free Syrian against the regime. The regime is not protecting any minorities, if you want to call it. He's using everyone to protect himself. We have uh, Alawites, we have Christians, we have uh, Kurds with us in the coalition. We are representing all uh, sects of Syria. But the regime is only representing his, his self and his family, despite the fact that he, yeah, he does not represent the Syrian people, not any sect. Although he has very much changed the narrative, hasn't he? So there is a very different narrative going on at the moment. This gentleman here. Yeah? No? Yeah? I know I know you, but... Uh, yes, I know. <laughs> and I know you. Uh, Steve Erlicher from the New York Times. Um, the Syria we talk about is over. It's gone. I mean, let's start from there. 
uh, whether it's divided, what happens to it. Um, what I want to ask you is, talking to people in the White House, they suddenly say, we have a national interest in Syria, which is what they didn't used to say. And what is the national interest? It's the lawless territory in which terrorism flourishes. So my question to you, the panel, is if you were judging American policy from the outside, wouldn't you conclude that actually America is backing Assad at this point? We're going to come to Amory last. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would let uh, you answer this specific uh, question. One thing that is clearly changing is the spillover from Syria in neighboring countries. And among the neighboring countries, one that gets very little attention but is in very deep trouble is Iraq. And I cannot imagine that this is of no interest to the United States. What is happening in Anbar province is under the radar screen of the world but it's incredibly worrisome because we have now, over three months only, 340,000 displaced people because of Sunni Shia fight, a sectarian fight. They are moving also towards the Kurdish region of, of Iraq, where people are now sandwiched between the refugees coming from Syria and the internal displacement coming from, from, the, uh, from, from uh, Anbar province. And when you see that, that risk of Islamic State of Iraq and Syria in Syria and Islamic State of Iraq and, Le and Levant in Iraq connecting that, to me, is a very dangerous development, even more dangerous of the pressure that refugees are putting on Lebanon because of the extremism and because of the danger it has on what may happen in Iraq. So that spread, I, I can imagine, is of everybody's interest, keen interest to follow. And, I, and actually, I would agree very much with people on the panel who are saying Syria despite of the fact that Ukraine is in our face, may be the more dramatic geopolitical challenge. Ali, do you want to uh, answer that question as yeah, well? Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. concerning uh, the extremists, I, uh, I, uh, I'm not sure if Mr. Obama is supporting the extremists, but what I'm sure of is that Bashar al-Assad is supporting the extremists. Uh, we, the, the Syrian opposition, have been fighting Al-Qaeda and Bashar al-Assad troops. We have been fighting the extremist uh, uh, revolutionary guard coming from Iran and uh, the sectarian militia coming from Iraq and from Lebanon, Hezbollah. And above all, we are fighting Al-Qaeda. Uh, what can we do? The, you know, we were hoping that the international community and Mr. Obama will support the, the more moderate uh, Syrian people we as opposition, as the Syrian population. But unfortunately, he was doing nothing for the last three years. He was just drawing red lines and letting Bashar al-Assad to cross it. And at the end, not, o not only Syria will be paying the price of this extremist group, the whole world will pay, the whole world will suffer. Sally, do you want to? Yeah, because first of all, I agree with the premise that Iraq and Syria as we've known them, or as they have been actually manufactured 90 years ago, are no longer going to be there. It will be very difficult to put, as President Clinton once said about Bosnia, Humpty Dumpty together. And in fact, I would like to urge you to see, and sorry, this is a strategic session, but historically, what we are seeing is in the past 20 years is really the final settling of scores and homogenization of all societies from the last remnants of the Ottoman territories from the Balkans all the way to the Middle East. I personally don't think we know how to deal with it. And the, given the example of Iraq, the real uh, issue in Syria would be whoever displaces Assad, you cannot allow that remaining state apparatus to actually dis be dismantled. Because otherwise we will have total chaos 
uh, but with, with, with de a degree of state apparatus, we may be able to put the pieces together, but they will never be the same as they were before. Nobody talked about this. We are talking about rehabilitating, uh, uh, correcting uh, uh, the state apparatus, not dismiss it. No, I, I didn't mean yep. you. I, I think, I think you're, you're agreeing on this one. Anne-Marie. Yeah, of course. So I agree. We finally say we have an interest. We always had an interest. We were just too obdurate not to see it. Um, but I don't think it means we're supporting Assad. What it means is we're no longer supporting the opposition as we were. We originally had the narrative that we supported the opposition, Assad must go. We now cannot bring ourselves to support Assad, rightly, but neither can we then say, no, but we're going to support the opposition all out. So we're stuck. So that what's what it has meant is we're 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 not doing anything. Uh, we are supporting the moderate opposition in some ways. We're training them, but but not uh, not enough. Um, what it probably will mean, just as we use drones in Yemen and in 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 Mali, we have the authority under our law to to now go after Al Qaeda in Iraq and in in uh, eastern. Eastern Syria, of course, Al Qaeda has actually disavowed ISIS. They're too extreme even for Al Qaeda. But it does mean that now seeing that, we have a different view in terms of that's a direct threat to us. And I suspect we might go there. And you remember th who was sending the, uh, the cars and the terrorists to Iraq before the revolution? It was the Syrian regime. Uh, it's becoming, if anything, more complicated. This lady over here. My name is Elsie Weiss. I come from Lebanon, from the Lebanese Forces Party. My question goes to Commissioner Georgieva. We are 4 million in Lebanon, and as you know, we have over 1 million th uh, 300 uh, Syrian refugees, which is almost 25% of the country. So we have a humanitarian crisis in Lebanon. We have an econo economical crisis because 28% almost 30% are unemployed, and uh, we have political and tensional crisis. Uh, would, would it be possible to have camps for refugees inside Syria under, uh, let's say, secured by the international community first in order to avoid any, uh, any bad results in the neighboring countries. Second, for, uh, I don't recall your name, uh, but uh, for the terrorist thing uh, of Saudi Arabia or other things, I, I have to tell you that in Lebanon in 2008, we had a war in, uh, in uh, Nahr al-Barat camps in the north, yeah. and it appeared that <coughs> the terrorists were brought from Syria. And in August, we had two attacks in Tripoli. And uh, Ali Mamluk, which is the head of Syrian intelligence, was the one uh, means responsible. And we had also a year and a half ago, a former minister, who's Ali Mamluk, were bringing to Lebanon 23 uh, like bombs in an attempt to make uh, uh, terrorist attacks in Lebanon. So I can say that Assad is the one manipulating first the terrorists. And Assad is using it and the West has received it, that uh, the only solution is if you drop Assad, then you are uh, uh, encouraging the terrorism. So we think the Syrian National Council and the Free Syrian Army are now fighting against the terrorists, and there's no more argument uh, to say that we cannot support them. Uh, First. Second, okay. no, no, just no. One, more, one, one more thing on the Christian ten minorities. Seconds, ten seconds, literally ten yeah, seconds. We are Christians in Lebanon, and we were persecuted for 15 years from the Syrian. Only in 2005, after the Cedars Revolution, we could uh, work again. We were banned even to say that we are okay. Lebanese Forces Party. So Assad is by Assad regime. So Assad is only using the tools of the Christians and terrorists, Great. and the West has received it, unfortunately. It's, a, it's an important point, but let me get back to the panel. Okay. The, uh, to the question you directed to me, two parts of the answer. First, we are very determined to deliver as much as possible assistance inside Syria, exactly because if we don't do it, not only people would suffer tremendously, but the flow of refugees will continue. That doesn't mean that it is easy to set up camps inside Syria. Because if we take responsibility to set up a camp, we also have to protect it. And without boots on the ground, that is really not an easy thing to do. But we can do mu much more than we currently do to deliver assistance inside to people where they are displaced, uh, not necessarily under the banner of an institutionally set up a camp. So achieves the same objective you are asking for. But equally important, it is to continue to support the countries in the region.
to support them in humanitarian terms, but also to help local communities. Uh, a year ago, Kat is here, she was a part of it. In the EU, we made the decision not to provide only humanitarian aid to refugees, but to also to provide help to local communities who are hosting it and macroeconomic support to Lebanon and Jordan so they can withstand. Because the, what the refugees are, flow is doing is depressing wages, Syrians work for nothing, and increasing costs. And that is an enormous hardship for people there. That comprehensive approach to the refugee crisis is what we are advocating for and putting, and putting our money where our mouth is and funding. I was given some rules, and it wasn't in the rules that I wasn't allowed to take two questions at the same time. So as we're running out of time, I am going to take this gentleman in, in the second row, and then the gentleman right in front of him, please. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Ahmed Galul. I'm from Tunisia. <clears throat> well, I'm asking a question which everybody might know the answer. It might be good to put it in public. Really, what is the real conflict right now in Syria? Is it just a conflict between the senior P Syrian people and Assad regime? Um, who is really fighting who in Syria? Is it just really Assad regime and the Syrian people? If the international community is trying to tell us that they are incapable of solving the problem, might it be a good solution to try to ban other agent and political agent to interfere in Syria because it, it seems that the fight is not really justified between the Syrian people and the Assad regime. And it seems that it is really making it worse and worse. Thank you. Good question. The gentleman in front. Thank you. Musharraf Zadi from Pakistan. I, uh, I'm just a little concerned. <laughs> <clears throat> that because of Parvez's phrasing of the question, it hasn't really been answered by the panel. So let me put it in the form of a question. Why is nobody really addressing the role that Saudi Arabia has played in Syria and the role that Qatar has played in Syria? And why are none of the questions or the answers dealing with the absolutely malevolent role that those two countries have played in exacerbating what is true, uh, and I would agree with all the friends here that say that Assad is, is rank evil. Sure he is, and he must be got rid of somehow, but uh, Assad, uh, has, uh, it takes many to tango, and among those that are tangoing are the unspoken Saudis and the Qataris. Why, why won't somebody address that issue? I think it's a great question, and the two of them fit quite nicely together. This is not really, is it, about Assad versus the opposition. There's all sorts of other players, and how do we deal with the other players? Maybe, Sully, well, do you want to start? Well, I, I thought, I tr at least I tried to address this. Again, this is a regional power game, and obviously Saudi Arabia is a part of it just the way Iran is. They, their uh, competition or their struggle started with the Iraq invasion, which by, in by an incredible historical blunder, the Americans made the Iranians the more powerful force in the Gulf region, and everything actually followed from that. And the Saudis have been adamant in fighting this. They've been adamant in fighting the direction of history in Egypt. They've been adamant in fighting the direction of history everywhere else that they could. And in Pakistan as well, I'm well aware of the... And by the way, I mean, it's not just in Pakistan where the killing of the Shia had begun even in the 80s. Uh, but, and it's, it has now intensified everywhere. This sectarian language is taking hold and is continuing the poison. And of course, the continuation of the war in Syria is, is exacerbating the situation. Turkey, which used to have a secular foreign policy, advertently or inadvertently fell into the trap of that sectarian polarization, and God knows what kind of prices we're going to pay. So it is true that one has to do something about it, and, and the, the, Amer the American debate doesn't really address it. And, and th somehow, sometimes, you know, the American debate, what we all look to, because you know, you, international community and all that, we've got to look at the United States, is just driving anybody who can think sensibly crazy. Because it really has, it really has very little relevance to exactly what's going on regionally, and it, and it addresses America's domestic issues, but it doesn't address the real international or regional issues. That's why that is not mentioned, in my view. 
Go on, Anne Marie. You, you <laughs> stand well, up. There's so the, many uh, different aspects of the American <laughs> debate that could drive you crazy. I'm trying to figure out which which part uh, specifically you're, you're you're talking about. Uh, but 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 wait a minute. I want to be there. You're not really suggesting the Saudi government is funding Al Qaeda in Syria. There are plenty of Saudis, but not. I mean, let's be clear about what the government is doing and what broader supporters are doing. But my point again was, if the U.S. wasn't willing to act, and we weren't, then what we did was to turn to proxies, and this, and that is, that's, that was my answer there. That's part of the reason we're there. And until we're willing to act directly, somebody, we, we, we want support. We want support for the opposition. That's where we turned. Thank you. I'm, we have far more questions than we're going to get to. I want to go to another quick um, word cloud. Uh, you can tell I'm technologically maybe not quite up to this. Can we put the word cloud up on the screens? Hopefully the technolog technology people are up to it, however. Um, I'll tell you what the question is going to be. Um, we've heard about the humanitarian disaster problems, not just within Syria, but within the region. We've heard about the political challenges. Is the opposition together? Is it not? We've heard about the military challenges, far too many players. We've heard just recently about the fact that this is not about Syrian opposition versus the Syrian uh, government. This is far broader than that. There are far more players. So the question that is in a word cloud, so if you can open your pads, um, I'm going to hopefully get it up on the screen is what should be the international community's priority for Syria? And you're allowed one word responses. There you go. Um, so if you can go to your pads and to the word screen, uh, the word cloud section of your pads, we had it up there for a second. I hope everybody read really fast. What should be the international community's priority for Syria? One word. One word. We could just not use technology. Give me one word. Any word? Come on. Peace. Panel, no from the ideas. panel. Peace. 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 <laughs> Peace. Mir. In is, it, is it humanitarian? Is it military? Is it, is, it, is, it Syri is it Syria itself? Is it the Saudis? Is it the Turks? Is it the Americans? What's the priority? Is it humanitarian? Is it political? Non-intervention. Non Stability. Stability, containment. Put it back up. Refugees, reconciliation, level the playing fields, and then you can talk about solutions. Here we go. Fantastic, we have it. The reason I think this is interesting, so thank you all for, for stepping in where technology briefly failed. Um, the, 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 this is interesting to me because there isn't an answer. Um, and I think that's certainly what I've been hearing today. There's so many parts of it that need to be addressed um, and perhaps need to be addressed all at the same time. Where do you start? And I want to actually just finish by taking that question to each of the panelists. Where do you start? Uh, <laughs> Stability, I Russia, would, peace, intervention? Uh, oh, no, in, 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 uh, in this um, order. What's the next stage? In this order, my... Buck would go on the countries that are put but, there. You, you don't need to follow them, but where, where, yeah. do you, where, where is the next step um, to move the situation in Syria forward? What, yeah, what the, do we the, need to do the, next? The, the, the next step is to, to persevere with the peace process. The peace it process. is going to take a long, long time, but we have to persevere with the pr peace process. We cannot just drop it and then say, oh, well, it's very difficult. So persevere with the peace process. And do we have the right people in the peace process? Um, part of the discussion here indicated that we need to be more forceful of making sure that everybody Everybody's that plays them. a role regionally is in. I mean, my personal solution, get all these guys, put them in the room, lock the door, throw the key. You can get out only when you have peace. Will you be providing humanitarian assistance to them in the room? I would give them a little bit of... Bread and water, and that's it. And let's add, a, let's add a few women to the guys. <laughs> uh, Alia, do you want for to? For the Iranian and uh, Hezbollah militias and the Iraqi militias to fall out of Syria. How do we make that happen? 
by uh, no fly zone by uh, 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 more pressure from the international community, even by threatening to use power. So you would say a military, yes, if necessary, a military. And how yeah. do we differentiate the good guys from the bad guys? We don't have uh, Hezbollah's good guys now in Syria. It's not time for terrorism, uh, t uh, tourist. Uh. So every everybody on the wrong side of a line everybody that moves is bad. Everybody from outside Syria to leave Syria now. We don't need uh, foreigner fighters. Okay, I I I still think it's kind of hard to identify them potentially, but Sully. No, it's uh, very easy when you are on ground. Whatever, whatever can be done within reason on the humanitarian issue, uh, institutionally helping the countries that are actually getting uh, the refugees as well. well. At the same time, basically, by Western powers really making up their minds, since they cannot do with, with all, the, all the parameters, stick to one. If Iran is the key, then just deal with Iran. And that may alleviate the problems of, 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 of Lebanon as well. And quite frankly, given what's going on with Russia, I see no other major actor key than Iran. And that way you can also get to, to the Saudis. So it's, it's, it's humanitarian and it's Iran. The humanitarian first thing is forward. immediate. Is okay. immediate and it is getting out of hand, destabilizing all the countries around. Anne-Marie. Not the humanitarian, but humans. I'm looking up at the, the stream. You know, there are two ways to think about Syria, and, and we focus mostly on the geopolitical proxy war, the chessboard, the strategic calculations between Qatar and Iran and Saudi Arabia and Russia. I want to start with the humans. Europe, more than any place on earth, should understand that when a government massacres its own people, bad things follow. That's why you could see what was going to happen three years ago. That's why this, we are still where we are. You start with the proposition that a government that is massacring its own people in the worst possible ways, and between, as far as I'm concerned, if your kid is killed by a barrel bomb versus a chemical weapon, it doesn't really matter. That that's what you have to stop. You have to stop that killing, not just the refugees, the humanitarian, but the, the destruction of human beings within Syria. If you focus there, everything else will follow. I don't know about anybody else. I started off extremely depressed, and I actually I, I finished just marginally depressed, which I think is a good thing. Um, I want to thank um, our panelists for, for joining us today, and at least for me, uh, putting forward some optimism that there is something can be done in some of these little areas that can make small steps to progress. Maybe we have to wait a little bit longer to see how the Iran uh, nuclear deal plays out. And to thank you all for um, coming on a Saturday morning and joining us. But please join me in thanking the panelists. <laughs>